So here we, so let me give you the overview. It's going to be six sessions. So it's every, it'll be every Saturday, 9 a.m. California time. So that will be um, 11 Oklahoma time, correct? Um, central time is, that's two, your central time, right? Yeah, central. So then New York time or Becky's is, will be 12, my time. But it's all being recorded. You'll have a link, you'll have worksheets and all that kind of stuff. I will upload them to my website and give you guys the login. So it'll be six sessions. Um, I, I believe it goes to November 14th. So the first session we're going to do, we're going to talk about understanding the kingdom. Because I think that's where the disconnect is with the body of Christ, is they don't understand that we live in another system. And that there are kingdom dynamics that we have access to that don't apply to the world system. Then the second session will be on the realm of demonic activity and structure. If we are going to be effective intercessors, we are going to have to understand the demonic realm. We're going to have to understand the power and the authority that the enemy has. Enemy has. He doesn't have power and authority over us, but he has power and authority. And we have to understand the structure and the realm and learn how to navigate through that. The third session will be on understanding angelic intervention. Intervention. This session is really excited for me because we have to, I don't think we pull on our angels enough. There is, there is angelic assistance. When I was in Nashville a couple of weeks ago, I, I have never seen an angel. I can't say I've, I've visibly seen an angel, but my five-year-old son did. I remember when he's 30 now, but when he was five, he had an angelic visitation. And um, angels travel. The, the only time we can see angels is when they slow themselves down because they travel at the speed of light. And anything traveling at the speed of light is invisible to the naked eye. But when they slow down, we are able to see them. He was five years old and he said, mom, you know, he called it the stranger. He said, mom, he got up to go to the bathroom and he said, mom, I saw the stranger. And so I immediately asked him, were you afraid? And when, and when he said he wasn't afraid, then I knew it was an angelic visitation, not a demonic one. And so the angel, he said, the angel looked at him and smiled and said, um, it's going to be all right. And when he became about 16 or 17, that came back to me because he started really, really, really struggling. And one day he's going to tell his own testimony. Testimony. He's a, a very successful chef now, but he was suicidal. He was on drugs. I really was in the mindset that I was going to bury him. I really thought I'm just going to have to bury this kid and deal with it. But I remember God brought that encounter back to my um, remembrance. And he said, everything's going to be all right. And then he said the angel looked at him and smiled and then went into the room of my younger daughters at the time. And he said he went out the window. And I knew it was supernatural because we had um, nailed their window shut so, because it was too close to the ground. But when I was in Nashville, I could not see angelic activity, but I could feel it. When the prophet began to minister, you could just feel this gush of wind begin to blow through. And I knew it was angelic visitations. And angels are not, we, the picture that we see of angels is this little tiny baby cherub. Angels are not in baby form. They are huge. They are, are very um, large and powerful creatures. There's one passage in the Bible where it says an angel, I believe, wiped out 80,000 people in one swipe. They are very powerful creatures and they have been given, the Bible. Hebrew says, they have been given to the saints as ministers of light. So they are assigned to us. We just have to learn how to deploy them and put them to work. The fourth session is going to be the power of your personal prayer life. As an intercessor, you have to have a personal prayer life. You and, and we all struggle in our flesh and I get off my devotion sometime and sometimes I do it in the morning and sometimes I do it at night and sometimes I don't do it at all, you know. But we have to have a discipline. You know, life happens to us all. We get busy. We get Life happens. But we have to have a discipline of personal prayer. Catherine Coleman, who was, I don't know if you guys are familiar with her, but she was a very powerful healing evangelist in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she said, I never spent more, more than an hour in prayer. But she said, I never spent an hour without praying. So that tends to be my prayer discipline where I'm just praying in the spirit throughout the day. I pitch my tent close to the throne room 
so that if God has something to say or he needs to pull me in for an assignment that I'm, I'm positioned and I am available. Session five is gonna be on your spiritual jurisdiction and assignment. As a prophet, you have a jurisdiction, you have a realm that you are assigned to. And it could be geographical, like as God is expanding ministry for me, I had a prophetic word that said that the foreign sands were calling me. I've been to Nigeria, I've been to Israel, I've connected with Chaz in the UK, I've connected with another woman um, um, in, the, in India, and in Nigeria, God is starting to connect me to the nations um, because that's a prophetic call in my life. But also um, domestically, I feel a pull towards Oklahoma City. There's, I have a, a, a following in Oklahoma City, which I love. I've been going there for like 20 years. I feel a pull in Nashville and I feel a pull in the Dallas area. And so asking, getting instructions, getting assignments. So we have to understand too that, that we have a jurisdiction where we have a realm we'll talk about Samuel, how he, the Bible says from Dan to Beersheba, he was known as a prophet. That wasn't just that they knew who he was. That was his jurisdiction in his realm. And then there's also a, a situational jurisdiction. What are you assigned to? I am assigned to healing trauma in prophets. My jurisdiction is to heal prophetic people, especially in the area of trauma. I have an anointing. I'm not trained in that field, but I remember the Holy Spirit said an anointing will trump a degree anytime. I'm not trained educationally in that field, but I'm trained in the spirit in that field because Jesus is the chief physician and he, he, he spans the gamut of all disciplines. And then and the sixth session will be on spiritual mapping and the third watch. That's going to be real, really powerful too. I'm going to teach you how to map out your jurisdiction. You should never ever go into a region and not know what's going on in that region or what's going on in that city or what's going on in that church. And then the power of the third watch. When I started assuming the position, I was, the Lord told me go on every day for 30 days. And I was tired. I was exhausted because I was up every morning at three o'clock in the morning. And from day to day, I didn't even know what we were, I was going to talk about. I was up at three, that third watch space, which is so powerful. We're going to talk about that. Um, asking God, what are we talking about today? I had no clue half the time what he wanted to say. And at three o'clock, I'd be up and just taking notes and stuff. So that will be the sixth session. It's going to be really powerful. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to open up in prayer real quick. So Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. I cover every person listening to the sound of my voice, God, and I decree supernatural protection, supernatural insight, supernatural clarity, God. I thank you that angelic forces are being released. I come against every satanic assignment against their lives right now where Satan has been trying to hinder them, stop them, stop them from hearing your voice, oh God. I thank you that even through this session, even though it's about intercession, Lord God, I thank you that you're healing every single area of trauma, everything broken in their bodies, Lord God. I decree supernatural health in the name of Jesus. I decree everything in their life is coming in alignment and in agreement with the word of God. I decree that no weapon formed against them will prosper. Every tongue that will rise up against them shall con be condemned. I command the activity of the enemy because I have authority over him. We have authority over him that all his activity will cease and desist, that contrary wind, winds will stop. And I thank you that the wind of the spirit will begin to blow in. I thank you for fresh revelation, Lord God, insight, clarity concerning purpose and destiny. I decree that everything their hands touch will prosper in the name of Jesus, Lord God, and we seal it by the blood. And so let's talk about prayer. So the word prayer, so the session one is prayer, understanding prayer in the kingdom. Remember I said, we live in a completely different system and we got to understand our system. It's like going to another country. When I went to Nigeria, it, I had to learn the ways of Nigeria. And it was foreign to me because I was in a foreign country, Israel. I had to learn how the, the, the nation of Israel operated. And that's the same way it is. We don't operate in the kingdom of God the same way we operate in the, in the world system. A woman said a few years ago when the, the government was shut down, she said the government is closed, but the kingdom is still open. We are not subject to the vicissitudes of this life. 
what happens in the world system does not effect, affect our economy because we live, we live in an economy of reaping and sowing. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And we're storing up treasures in heaven, not on this earth. So the, the Hebrew word for prayer is prosuke maye, and it means to interact with the Lord by switching human desires for his wishes as he imparts faith. So prayer is, God, I need a car. God, I need healing. This is my human desire that I'm presenting to God because it means to move in the direction of someone that's inferior. So we are inferior in a sense to God. And so when we pray, he is moving and leaning in our direction. So I'm saying, God, I need healing in my body. And so what he does, he switches our desire and what we need for his wishes and imparts faith. And his desire when we need healing is that ye be healed and that ye be made whole. And we know that because we read the word of God. When the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, he said, be made whole. When the lepers came to him, the three, I believe it was 10 lepers came to him and wanted to be healed. He said, be made whole and show yourself to the priest. So it's his desire that we be healed because it's in his word. And then he releases the faith for us to believe. Because we don't have that level of faith to believe things can transpire in the supernatural. And so let me say that again. It's our desires that we're giving to God. He's releasing his mandate on what we ask for and then releasing the faith to get it done. So it took faith for me. When God started dealing with me about quitting my job, it took faith for me to quit my job. I was making six figures. Um, making a lot of money. I worked wherever I wanted to work. It, because it was such a large organization, I could work in any office in, the, in, the, in this Southern California region. And so it was a really good job. And when he started dealing with me, of course, I started thinking about provision like that. I have a house note, I have a car, I have five kids. You know, I started really thinking about that. But then he gave me the, he released the faith from me. He said, Yvonne, this is my will. This is my will for you. And he released the faith for me to believe. And when he released the faith for me to believe, I couldn't get out of there quick enough. I was so ready to go. It was like, okay, God, I'm done. You're done and I'm done. I got that job supernaturally and I was released supernaturally. And so God gives us the faith to believe because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And one of my favorite life scriptures is Abraham. When God told Abraham, I am, you're going to have a, a child in at your age, you and Sarah are going to have a child. The Bible says that Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was fully persuaded that God would do everything that he promised. I'm in a position in my life where because he has been so so um, faithful to me in this area, I've been faithful to him that I stagger not at the promises of God through unbelief. I don't live paycheck to paycheck anymore, but I live day to day. God, this is this is what I need to take care of today. This is what I need to take care of today. I'm not, anxiety is in the future. Depression is in the past and peace is in the present. When we stay in the present, the peace of God will guard our hearts and guard our minds. So prayer is a universal practice in all religions, but what differs for God's people is that we pray, I love this, we pray to a God that is close, who, who is present, who listens and attends to the affairs of humanity. God said, I am concerned about everything that concerns you. I think one of the most prophetic songs that has been released in the last five or so years was, he's a good, good father. He is a good father. And he is concerned about everything that concerns us. He says, every hair on your head is numbered. Um, your name is engraved or tattooed in the palm of his hand. He knows you individually. He doesn't know us as a church. He doesn't know us as a group. He doesn't know us as an individual and a family. He knows you by name. He knows you individually. In Psalms 115, and so in Corinthians, I, I believe 1 Corinthians, when we see the gifts of the Spirit, or the man, they're really not gifts, they're really manifestations of the Spirit. They're how the Spirit manifests itself when we collectively get together in what we call church or the ecclesia. The Spirit will manifest in, 
in healings and in miracles and signs and wonders and prophecy and all that kind of stuff. But what he was teaching the Corinthian church was they were, uh, they were a group of people that worship idols. And he was teaching them in that passage, 1 Corinthians 12, um, the manifestations of the spirit that no, you now serve a God that answers, that's close, that hears you, that responds. And Psalms 115 says this, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mother through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. They're saying you're worshiping idols, but they cannot respond to you. Um, I know in California, when we would go get our nails done at certain salons, you'd see the Buddha statue in there with fruit all around them. That's an idol. They are worshiping and responding to somebody that cannot respond to them. And so prayer is, so when we go into prayer, we have the, the expectation that God is going to answer. God is going to respond. God is going to release strategy. God is going to, um, if it's a prayer, we'll talk about the different levels of prayer, different types of prayer. If it's, um, if we're hurting, God is going to respond to us. There's nothing that can go on in our lives that he is not concerned about. Nothing, 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 nothing. And I had to learn that and get in that mindset because it's all a mindset. I had to get in that mindset that God cares about me, that I'm just not some random person that was thrown on the earth against my will and that he doesn't know who I am and I'm just here taking up space until I die and go to heaven. But he's concerned about every single area of my life, every area. And so I had that, I think last couple of days in prayer was the first time that I had a visual of me sitting on my father's lap. And that was powerful for me because I've struggled throughout my walk with, you know, that orphan spirit, which a lot of prophetic people do, where you just don't feel accepted. There's a lot of rejection going on. Prophets tend to deal with a lot of abuse, abuse, what I'll talk about later um, in the prophetic session, but we tend to deal with a lot of abuse and abandonment and drug addiction and molestation and all this kind of things because Satan's ultimate job for a prophetic person is to silence their voice. If we look at the life of Moses, Herod was trying to kill, not Herod, but um, Pharaoh was trying to kill all the children under two years old, but God spared Moses. And Jesus is like, Herod was trying to kill all the boys under two years old because he knew that a prophet was arising that would shift the, 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 the course of the, of the, of the um, society that they were present in. And God spoke to Jesus's father, Joseph, and had him move Jesus to Egypt for seven years until Herod died. So Satan's always trying to silence the voice of the prophets. That's why you will see a lot of trauma around a prophet's life very early in life. And so let's talk about the um, types of prayer. First type of prayer, and this is not exhaustive. This is just about what kind of ministered to, for witness with my spirit. First type of prayer is um, the prayer of petition. And petition is just a formal request by a group of people. So, um, Second Chronicles 7.14, which is a familiar passage, is that um, if my people who will call by my name shall humble themselves and pray. So that was a group of people that were petitioning God. Um, when a church goes into a place of prayer, we are a group of people petitioning God, asking him for whatever it is that we need at the time. The next one is an entreaty, and it's an, an earnest, and I'll give you guys all these notes too. It's an earnest and humble request. You know, God, hey, I need to pay my rent. Oh, God, I need to, you know, finish school. It's an earnest request to God. It's, it's usually personal to you asking God for, I hate to use the word favor, but we, we're asking God for a favor. The next one is supplication, and it's a request accompanied by awe and admiration. We are just interacting with him based on who he is, on his glory. We're grateful for his presence in our life. Um, we're in awe of his glory, you know, and, and we admire, you know, who he is because worship is really about who he is and not on what he has done. And then the, the next prayer is the prayer of thanksgiving. And it's just an expression of gratitude. Like, God, thank you that you saved my son. 
thank you that I got this job. Thank you that, hey, I passed my test, girl. Thank you that, you know, you have cared for me during this time when I was sick. We're just, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. And then praise is also a prayer, even though we can, we um, attribute praise and worship to always music and the thing that goes before church. It's so much deeper than that and so much more widespread than that. Sometimes there are just times where I get in the presence of God and I am just praising him for what he has done in my life. Worship is who he is. And we're going to break down the character of God. I don't know how far I'm going to get today, but um, praise is just thanking him for what he has done to the small things. God, I thank you that I got in the store before it closed. I thank God. I praise God for everything. Anything that makes my life easier, I praise God for. Because, I mean, he's just so, he's just, a, he's just so awesome. And then the, the next prayer is a lament. It's a prayer accompanied with grief and sorrow. In the, in the um, Garden of Gethsemane, that was a, a prayer of lament, lament. Jesus was like, if this cup can pass from me, because he knew he was about to be crucified. He knew he was about to take on the sins of the world. And so he was feeling a lot of grief and sorrow. And I can imagine as a human being, fear. So he was lamenting to God. There was a book in the Bible called the Book of Lamentations. It's a book of grief and sorrow that life happens sometimes. Things happen. You know, people die. We lose jobs. You know, we have to move suddenly. There's natural disasters. You know, things happen and we're just praying. We're just uh, connecting with him because we feel grief and sorrow. The Bible says um, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And then the last prayer, which we're going to delve into in depth, is intercession. So what, um, and I'm going to break down intercession, not yet, though. Let's talk about prayer in the kingdom. So Jesus and prayer. Jesus made prayer. He made time for prayer throughout his entire life. He did not pray on the go or on the run. He set aside time to pray, and you will see several times in scriptures, I'm going to read scriptures, but several times where it said Jesus pulled away from the crowd to pray. Jesus went into prayer. Jesus had, Jesus spent time in prayer because we have to understand that intercessors, we are not praying our will. We are praying the will of the Father. The Bible says that God works out all things according to the counsel of his own will. And we cannot effectively intercede if we don't know the will of the Father. If we look at the life of Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, the will of the Father was to save Sodom and Gomorrah if Abraham could find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he's like, God, five. Then like two. And um, because he could not find anyone righteous, God could not save Sodom and Gomorrah. So we are always constantly praying the will of the Father. And so I'm going to read um, John, um, St. John 5, 18 through 20. And so um, the backdrop is the Pharisees tried to kill Jesus because he was praying and working on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was considered holy, but in the New Testament, so some like biblical context is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the closing of the Old Testament. They're the closing of the Old Covenant. And for us, we step into the scene in the book of Acts, where we were all grafted into the vine. So you st still saw a lot of the laws and the rules and the regula regulations going on. Je Jesus was, while Jesus was alive, they were still sacrificing animals, even though we don't see that in the text. The backdrop was they were still sacrificing animals for sin. And that's why Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was the final sacrifice. While during, during Pentecost, which I think this is just amazing context, during the, he, got he got crucified during the, the high holidays. And they were sacrificing animals all over the, the city because of, I believe it was Pentecost. Not Pentecost. It was, I'll, I'll give you that information. I can't think what the holiday it was then. But but then when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. There was, there, he said, the Bible says he, in the book of Hebrews, he is the final sacrifice. So he came to bring another kingdom, another structure, another law. And they were trying to keep him in the old structure of, you cannot do anything on the Sabbath. 
And the powerful thing, this is cyborg, the powerful thing about Jesus is that the Bible says that when he said it is finished and he hung his head, the Bible says that the earth split open and 500 people got up out of the ground or many people got up in the ground and went into the city. So there is the power of resurrection on his life. And so they were trying to keep him to the Sabbath. And, and he was like, and then he said, I am the Sabbath. He said, I am Lord of the Sabbath because he now became the rest. Sabbath was rest. And now our rest is in him, not in a holiday. And so I'll read the passage. That was a context for it. It says, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. The penalty for breaking the Sabbath in the Old Testament was death. They would kill you if you worked on the Sabbath. A man was picking up sticks on the Sabbath and they killed him. They put him to death, brought him to Moses and God said, put him to death. That's how serious the Sabbath was. And then it says, and, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very, 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 verily, I truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And so that is the, the disposition of an intercessor. We are doing what the father does. We are saying what the father to, says. And so intercession is not always prayer in the sense of what we consider prayer. Sometimes it could be intercession in, because as an intercessor, it means you are a go-between. It can be intercession in the, in the essence of an act. If God says, speaks to you, go take that sister some food. You are a go between that person and God, and you are interceding on that person's behalf because God has spoken to you. And it says, because remember Jesus prayed, but he also healed the sick, raised the dead, and all that kind of stuff. So the, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. And so let's look at, um, I want to really, really give you, I hope this part does not bore you because I really want to give you biblical context to where we are. Biblical context has made, helped me understand because I, I have a, well, I have a degree in biblical studies, but it helped me understand the Bible in a whole different way. It helped me understand my position in a whole different way and helped me see my assignment in a different way. Because it's not just spiritual, it's natural too. And we need to learn how to navigate these waters. So this is Jesus in motion in prayer. Matthew 14, 23 says, And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Luke 6, 12 says, It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. He spent the whole night in prayer to God. And even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's like, can you not just tarry for one hour? Can you not pray for one hour? Really honing in to them that this is a discipline. This is a sacrifice. This is something that's necessary. Mark 135 says, and, and in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded pray place and was praying. So remember Jesus, Jesus many times prayed, which we're going to talk about in the last session, on the third watch. The, the, the miracle of him walking on the water, that was during the third watch. And I've been on the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, even though it says it's, it's, a, it's actually um, geographically a lake, it's actually a lake, but it's a very, very large lake. And so he was on that, the Sea of Galilee, and it was on the, th it was dark. That's why they thought he was a ghost and not a man because he was in that third watch period. He got up early while it says early while it was still dark. That is such a powerful, powerful time to pray. And Mark 14, 35 says, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. This is the prayer in the garden. And then Luke 11, one says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And then we know that passage in, um, you know, that kingdom come, thy will be done, the whole passage um, on earth as it would, the Matthew 6 prayer. And so he taught his disciples to pray. One of Jesus's main assignments was to introduce the people to another way of living. 
by establishing the kingdom of God. So when we are interceding, we are establishing the kingdom of God in a situation, in a region, in a circumstance, in a person's life. We are establishing the kingdom of God and it says he came and Jesus came to usher in a new world order. Just like Satan with this COVID-19 thing, I'm not saying the virus is not real. To me, it's the flu. We get the flu every year. It's, it's new strains every year because viruses mutate. And so, but as we see Satan trying to usher in this new world order where, you know, there's no more change and we got to use our credit cards, we can't use cash, all these things is trying to happen. Jesus came to do the same thing. They were on a sacrificial system where they were sacrificing thousands and thousands of animals um, to for repentance. They, they could only atone for the sins of man, you know, once a year. We can go to Jesus anytime we need to. We have 1 John 1 and 9 for atonement. We ask for forgiveness. We can approach, we can boldly approach his throne of grace. And anytime that we need to, we can slip in and out of the throne room anytime we need him when they could only do it one time a year. Um, he was ushering in a whole new religious system, a new government, and a new economy. And that's why Jesus always talked about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of heaven is light or the kingdom of God. He was, he was shifting the mindset and, and understand the, I learned this in Israel, understand the, the climate, the mental culture, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the religious structures of the day. And they were upset that Jesus, that's why you saw all the broken, the destitute, the poor followed Jesus. Those were the people that followed Jesus, not the rich, not the, the, those in powerful positions. They didn't follow Jesus because they had their government and their system. Just like in America, we have our government and system and they are trying to to push their will on us but we got to pray because they don't a lot of people in those realms they don't think they need jesus because they have money they have power they have authority he came to the destitute and the poor he healed them he raised them he healed the sick he raised the dead and so he was letting them know i am bringing in a whole new system that you are not subject to this, this system we're to obey the laws of the land as believers and christians that's why I, I applaud the pastors that, especially in California, where we're on pretty much full shutdown, where they're not meeting. And the pastors that are obeying God and preaching and doing that, I, I applaud them for that. And then Luke 30, 30, 4.33 says, oh, so Jesus talked, let me, Luke 4.33, it says, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other town as well, for I was sent for this purpose. He was sent to usher in another kingdom and that's why it's so important and that's why i gave you all this backdrop because it's so important to understand that when you as a prophetic intercessor are praying you are operating under a whole nother dimension of authority and power there is a whole nother system backing you up because when we pray and when we declare the word of God, the Bible says in Psalms 120 that the angels of the Lord hearken diligently unto the voice of God. They move when we declare the word. A pastor that I follow, a prophet I follow, preached a message called Angels Go. We have to learn to deploy angelic assistance, especially in the place of intercession. And because Jesus was our high priest, and he was our, he is our example for intercession. When he was in the wilderness um, and Satan was attacking him, he always said, it is written. And the Bible says that when he came in one of the account, accounts of the gospel, when he came out of the wilderness, angels came and ministered unto him. And so I'm, I'm shifting the disposition that we're not throwing oil up and prayers up. We're praying from the throne room down. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're in, and so there's power and authority when we begin to pray. We're not hoping it's gonna happen. We're not wishing it's going to happen. We are decreeing and declaring that it is going to happen and manifest in our lives and in the lives of people. Job said, if you decree a thing, it shall come to pass. In Luke 17, 21, it says, when asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God will not come with observable signs, nor will people say, look, it's over here or it's over there. He said, for now, the kingdom of God 
Um, one passage says, one translation says, in your midst, meaning he was present, or the kingdom of God is now within you because Jesus came to usher in the, the presence of the Holy Spirit who now lives within us. And the kingdom, in, in the book of Matthew, the kingdom of God was mentioned 53 times, in the book of Mark, 17 times, in the book of Luke, 40 times. Jesus came in to usher another kingdom, and that is from the disposition in which we pray. And so let's talk, let's usher, let's move into the kingdom. I, all that backed up so we can move into the kingdom. And so the kingdom... So Jesus said, thy kingdom come. So the Greek word for kingdom is basilia, which means the king's domain or where a king rules in sovereignty. The kingdom of God is God's rule, God's realm, God's authority, and God's sovereignty. And he wants us to establish his kingdom in every single area of our lives. So we, so again, ushering in a kingdom. And so one of the one of the reasons we pray, you know, we've all heard this if we've been in church long enough, we pray and then we say in Jesus name. So the reason we're saying in Jesus name is not we're not just saying in Jesus name. The reason we're saying in Jesus name is because Jesus was Emmanuel. He was God with us and his name and that's what his name means. And in Jewish tradition, a name is significant in, in showing the identity of a person. So Jesus, his identity was God with us. Jesus was the flesh. Jesus was the man. Emmanuel was, was God with us. That's what it means. And the Greek word for, for name is called anoma. And anoma is synonymous with a, the character, the nature, and the authority of a person. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name. We're not just using his name as... Um, carte blanche or we're not using his name just to throw off say we know him we're using his name because of the authority that is in that name he was crucified he got up out of the grave he conquered death hell and the grave and the bible says there is no name above the name of jesus so we are praying we don't always we don't have to say in jesus name but we are praying in the character the nature the power and the authority of jesus and that's why he taught his disciples to pray because they had to learn how to pray in his authority. Because we have authority. And I want you to lift your hands real quick. If you're listening later or now, just lift your hands and say, I have authority. We have authority. I wanted to really drill that in. We have authority. We are not subject to demonic activity. We are not subject to being... Um, harassed by demonic spirits. The Bible says, I heard a pastor say, he said, we don't have to worry about our names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We have to worry about them being blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so your name being in the Lamb's Book of Life alerts demonic powers and spirits that you have authority to operate in this earth realm. It's the story, the sons of Sceva, they wanted to do what Paul was doing. And they went to go cast out demonic spirits. And the Bible says they ran out of that house, tore up with their clothes turned off. Because Satan knows who has authority. He knows who has delegated. We have delegated authority. It's like as a, as a mom, when my kids were younger, I did all the chores. But as they got older and more mature and understood what was happening, I delegated my authority. You have the bathroom, you have the kitchen, you have the living room. And so that's what happens when we begin to mature in God and understand the authority that has been given to us. God begins to delegate his authority. And that's where our jurisdiction and our assignments come in. I've delegated authority in Oklahoma. I've delegated authority in Nashville. I've delegated authority in the California region, in the, in the Dallas region. So you have delegated authority. Sherelle, you have delegated authority in the world of psychology. Shaz, you have delegated authority in healthcare. You guys have delegated authority. And so you come, you don't just go to work. You go to work to usher in a kingdom. We're not just picking up a paycheck. 
when I was working, I worked for one of the largest healthcare organizations in, um, in the nation, in my nation, because it was a cold system, it was a very unique system, but I would prophesy to people on my lunch hours. I remember uh, a young man I had a dream about, I worked with him, we weren't in the same department, I had a dream, he was having um, an affair on his wife, and I was like, oh Lord, I don't want that type of information. But I, pull, I saw him in the, in the hallway. I pulled him aside. I told him, I said, I don't know if you're a Christian. I don't know what you are, but I'm a Christian. I had a dream about you. This is what I believe the Lord's showing me. And he bowed over and began to weep and began to cry and tell me what was going on in his life. And I had the opportunity to pray for him, pull him out of that thing in the spirit because he was a Christian. And I thank God, God delegated authority to me to pull him out of the situation he was in. I believe as an intercessor, we are rescuers. We pull people out of situations, you know, poverty, hurt, loss, sin, that we are going in as secret service people, pulling things out. The prophet told me, he said, you are a Navy SEAL in the kingdom. Everyone may not know my name, I don't need everybody to know my name. I'm assigned to who I'm assigned to, and I'm on a special operative. And that's how you are in your sphere of influence. You are on a secret assignment for the kingdom of God, and you have delegated authority. So thus praying in the name of Christ means to pray as directed and authorized by him, bringing revelation that flows out of being in his presence, Praying in Jesus' name, therefore, is not a religious formula just to end prayers or to get what we want. It's not a religious formula. It's saying, I have delegated authority. So you don't always have to say in Jesus' name, but you come in the name of Jesus. You come in the power and in the authority of Jesus. And there is no, the only thing we cannot control in prayer is God's timing. God has a timing for everything. Sometimes we intercede for, we stop interceding when God has answered, or we have an unction in our spirit that the matter is settled. There are things that I have prayed for that I know the matter is settled, but I'm still in that realm of time. I'm still in the realm of God's timing. So a lot of times we may not see the manifestation of it, but because God has a, a realm of time that, that um, is in place. And according to Hebrews, let's see, Okay, so now this is where I want to break into understanding, really, who understanding the nature of God. Like, who is God? I uh, probably want, it's 9.52. I'm probably going to go to about 9, probably about 9.15 and then open it up for questions. Who is God? According to Hebrew notions, a name is inseparable from the person to whom it belongs. It is something of and about God is something of his essence. Therefore, in the case of the God of God, it, his name is, is especially sacred. The Bible in Matthew, where Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, Hallowed be thy name. And if you took my scribal class, a scribe, every time they wrote the name of God, they had to go wash and cleanse themselves. Because that's how sacred his name is. So who is God? We always hear Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God, Jesus, Spirit, Holy Spirit. Who is God? What is his nature? What is his character? Um, so that's what we're going to um, move into and talk about. So the first character of God is this. God is immutable. He said, I'm the God. I do not change. He is not like people. He doesn't waver. He doesn't change his mind. He is not irresponsible. He is trustworthy. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do something. And that's why we can rely on the word of God. It says, um, Psalms 102, 25, 27 says this, In the beginning, <clears throat> you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, like clothing, you will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same and your years will never end because you do not change. And that's why we have hope. So if he, is he, if he has healed in the past, he's still healing. If he has delivered in the past, he is still delivering. I know there's a, there's a sect of believers that don't believe in the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
God is still doing what he did in the Old Testament. He's still doing in the New Testament. He's still doing in this dispensation. He's always a healer. He's always a deliverer. He, the Bible says that, that he is a stronghold in the day. The name of the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. We don't have to suffer in silence. We don't have to live a, a miserable life. God, God is present like we, I talked about earlier. He's not an idol that cannot hear, see, speak, or contend. He is, um, he is always present. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. He is alive. He is not a statue. Jesus is not some figure on a cross because he's off the cross. And so he does not change. He said, I am the God that changes not. He is immutable. The next part of his character is that, character is that God is sovereign, which means he is supreme or ultimate in power. God's right, uh, sovereignty is God's right to exer exercise power over his creation. There was a, this man was giving a testimony about his wife. They were a young couple in ministry, had three young children. She was ministering one day and got this a severe headache. They rushed her to the hospital, found an inoperable brain tumor. He said, we prayed, we linked arms around the hospital, he said, and the Lord brought her home. He said, I learned at that moment that God is sovereign. That God, you know, we may have an agenda or we may want things to happen a certain way, but God is sovereign. He, he has another plan. There was a, and then there was this man, he, something happened to his throat. Couldn't talk for like two years. And he was a pastor, had to talk for a living. And on a radio station, he was giving his testimony and his voice came back. And, you, and he just was in shock on the radio because he hadn't talked in two years. There was a young prophet that I was um, mentoring about three or so years ago, and God brought him in my spirit. I've been the mentor and pour into him, and he was coming out of church one night, got hit by a car, and died. And so God is sovereign. That was that shook me. But God knows God. There's human will, and then there's the sovereignty of God. God knows what needs to happen. I had a child that died in between my son and I had a child that passed away. I had a stillbirth. So there are things that God knows that we don't know. And I don't, I'm not like bringing, like bringing it down because God is powerful and God moves in our behalf. But God is sovereign in a lot of areas and he knows things that we don't know. And so some of, I believe, some of the things that I've been through or experienced in my life, some of it I believe is the sovereignty of God that he knows me better than I know myself. I'm 56 and still learning about myself. And there are things that he's sovereign in. So Isaiah 45, 20 through 23 says this, gather together and come you fugitives from surrounding nations. What fools they are who carry around their wooden idols again and pray to God that cannot save. For there is no God but me, a righteous God and savior. There's none but me. Let all the world look to me for salvation. For I am God, there is no other. I've sworn by my own name, I've spoken the truth, and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. He is sovereign. And there are things in life that we will have to experience that we don't that may not necessarily be on our agenda. And there are things that God will supernaturally do in our lives, you know, that we don't even have any input. Like I I would have not have figured out this life for myself. Like some people don't know that I used to um, do a lot of work in Hollywood. My, my kid's father got a supernatural job in Hollywood. We, were, we had a meeting with Eddie Griffin at the time, and, and my, my, he was my husband at the time. He walked up and said, um, hi, my name is Roman, and he hired him on the spot. That was the sovereignty of God, because Eddie said, before you got there, I said, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And his name was Roman. So God was sovereignly moving. So I've done a lot of some of my best friends are Hollywood stars because God sovereignly moved me into that arena. There's no way I could get myself in that arena. It was a sovereign act of God. And, and I would not be able to make up this life for myself if I wanted to. You know, so, and I know some amazing things has happened to you guys in your life. And you're like, wow, how did I get here? Or how did that happen for me? Or, you know, God is sovereign and he knows how to manage and govern your life. And we have to trust that. 
you know, sometimes I, I think the hardest thing is not, not, not believing God is trusting God, like trusting that he knows what's best, especially when a situation can look completely different to us. Like when my baby died, that was like something I didn't expect, didn't anticipate and had to be, and I was in labor for 24 hours. But I even look how God orchestrated that. And, and Chaz, I know you, that, that you know about that because she is a maternity nurse. And I, I was in labor for 20, I was in hard labor for 24 hours. But the woman, the nurse that took me, because I came in as a, what they call a fetal demise. And the woman that took me, she said, nobody on the, she said, nobody on the schedule wanted to take you. She said, but God told me to take you. And that woman prayed in the spirit over me and she took care of me in the spirit and she encouraged me and she ministered to me and she walked me through that whole process. I think there was a shift at the end that she had to go home, but God sovereignly sent that woman to me. And without her, I probably would not have made it through that whole situation, you know? And I remember, I remember my kid's father, he, he was like, all the, all the, um, Fathers get to go to the nursery to see their baby and I have to go to the morgue because I was almost seven months old. But the sovereignty of God healed me. I had another son, my oldest son, like almost exactly. That baby was due on like October 5th and he was born on October 2nd. And if that baby had to live, I wouldn't have the son I have now. So God knew, God is sovereign. He knows, he knows how to manage your life. I think this is an L. And Psalms 115.3 says this, our God is in the heavens and he does as he wishes. So we have to trust that God knows what's best for our lives. He really, really does. And I know we've all been through some stuff and we've all experienced some stuff, but he is a God. He said, though you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Though you go through the waters, you shall not be drowned. And even with the, the Hebrew boys, nothing, the only thing that was burned on them was the thing that bound them. Not a hair on their head was singed. So I want you, so I just kind of feel like a lull here. I just want to stop and just worship God for a minute, for his sovereignty. And so God, we just worship you right now. We, we are so grateful that you know how to manage our lives better than we do, God. I decree that emotionally, and spiritually that we will come in agreement and in alignment with the plan that you have for our lives. You said that in our mother's womb, you knew us, Lord God, and that every single day of our lives is written in a book, that you know my coming out, my going in, you know what hurts me, you know what disappoints me, God. There is nothing about me that you don't know. There is nothing about your daughters that you don't know, nothing that they are experiencing right now, God, that you are not fully aware of and fully present in right now. So Father, we just thank you. We praise you right now that you are the Lord God high and lifted up and your train fills the temple. We will, even though this is a training, Lord God, we are stopping to acknowledge your presence in our lives, God. Some of us could be dead right now. Some of us could be out of our minds right now, Lord God. Some of us could be sick in a hospital right now, God, that you are concerned about everything that concerns us, Lord God. And so, Father, we worship your name. We worship you just because you are God. And you sit on the throne and majesty and we join in agreement god with the four and twenty elders that are crying holy 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 is the lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and so we lean into the fact that you are sovereign lord god we lean into the fact that you are immutable that you were the god that does not change lord god and even um make us help us make the shift in our minds that we live in another system god that we are citizens of a kingdom that we are in this world and not of it that we are sojourners in a world system but we our power our authority is in the kingdom of god and we have access to power 
and we don't have to suffer in silence. I silence every contrary wind in the life of your daughters and your sons, Lord God. And God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you, we magnify you, we lift you, and we hollow your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can just lift your hands and just worship him right now. I know all of you are worshiping about something different. And if you're listening to the recording, I want you to break for a minute and just worship his name. Worship his name. He is worthy to be worshiped. He is worthy to be exalted. He is worthy to be lifted. Hallelujah. God, I thank you that, that just even in this training that you are healing bodies, God. You are healing minds. Whew. You are healing situations, oh God. You are reversing situations in the name of Jesus. You are breaking satanic assignments. We bless you, God, as we come out of your presence. We are not in a training. We are coming out of your presence. We are in a kingdom meeting right now, Lord God. And I ask, I petition you for divine protection supernatural protection. I come against the backlash of the enemy, Lord God. I decree they are fully surrounded, fully protected. Their homes, their person, everything that, con their children, Lord God, their spouses, everything that concerns them is fully covered by the blood of Jesus. And we are hidden in the secret place of the Most High, where the enemy has no access to us. Because you are El El Yon, you are the, the, the breasted one, the all breasted one. And we thank you, God, and we bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. I just decree your situation is shifting right now. I'm interceding for you right now that your situation is shifting, Lord God. I thank you for supernatural strategy and clarity, Lord God. And I ask that you protect my sister on the road, Father. And God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you, and we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Does anybody, you guys can unmute yourselves and ask any questions you may have? Mm -hmm. No question? Ask a question. <laughs> but if we have no questions... <laughs> Hey, Miss Camper. Okay, my phone, phone keeps going in and out. I just um wanted to ask you, how do you know when God is about to find you to just go places to pray? Because I feel like that's what He's doing with me right now, but I'm not for sure. I just start feel. I think for me personally, I just start feeling a pull on my spirit, like concerning Oklahoma. I just started feeling like a pull on my spirit, like, okay, I, I think I need to go to Oklahoma. And then how you know for sure is that the peace of God, wherever the will of God is, there's the peace of God. And so the peace of God will start resting in your soul. Like, okay, God, I need to go prayer. And sometimes you just kind of move. I, um, the prophet that trained me would always say that God directs a moving vehicle. He said, if I even think it's God, I'm going to move on it. And then as you move, you'll know. If, if it's not him, you'll know it's not him. But if you're feeling that, then that's probably what he's moving on you to do. It's just sometimes we don't trust ourselves. But the, there's a scripture in Psalms that says, the thoughts of the righteous are right. 
So if you're feeling that pull, that, that's more than likely God telling you to, because Satan would not tell you to pull away for a time of prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So set up some, set your time up, honey. Just, I, I feel like there's some things he wants to tell you, but there's also a, a deposit that needs to be made in you for this next season of your life. I receive it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is Lisa. I, I wanted to ask, um, lately, um, it's been about a week now, um, I, I felt a need to get up at 12 a.m. to pray. And um, it's, sometimes I'm a little late, like um, I'll get up at 1, but I still pray. And then the first time I did it, I heard Holy, Holy Spirit say, um, would you not pray with me for an hour? Mm -hmm. And so um, so I've been praying for an hour. Um, lately, I'm, I'm listening to what you were saying about intercession um, today. I'm wondering, um, should I be listening to find out? Because um, the first few nights, I mean, the fire of God was upon me, but lately it's like kind of dwindling. I don't know if I need to press towards um, past that or if I should be sitting to ask God, what are we praying for? Um, I think it'd be, it could be two things. One, maybe the assignment may be coming to a close. Maybe he was having you intercede and pray for a, something specific because sometimes we don't always know what we're interceding for, especially... The Bible says, the Bible says in the book of Romans that the that we don't know what to pray for, but the spirit himself will make intercessions and groanings that we don't know about. And so if you're spending a lot of time praying in the spirit, then that's the Holy Spirit. And you may not necessarily know what the assignment is. And if you're starting to feel something lifting, then it could be that that particular assignment is over or that you do need to sit in in the presence of god and ask him you know what are we um what are we praying about what am what am i supposed to be focusing on and i wouldn't wait till prayer time i would ask start asking earlier in the day so when that time so when you hit that hour of prayer that you're right in it right 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 okay thank you you're welcome hi um, I've had frequent seasons, very frequent seasons of um, Holy Spirit prompting me to pray probably like two o'clock in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., but very, very frequent and more frequent than not frequent. So is that the third watch? Yes. Right. Third watch, um, we're going to really talk about, but the third watch is where it is almost silent in the spirit realm. And so around that 3 a.m. time, that's why Jesus did a lot of prayer. And so there's very little demonic activity during that, that third watch period. Thank you. Because mm -hmm. the Satanists don't get out of church till 7 o'clock. <laughs> they don't. I was, listening, I was listening to a Satanist. They go to, I think they go to church at midnight. <laughs> and then they get out at 7 in the morning. They go to church longer than we do. But... <laughs> <laughs> so there's very little it's very still i've been okay. up at those hours very very still yes yeah. you can get a prayer through around yeah. three o'clock and three four okay. five six in the morning you can get stuff through i don't know why but it's, it's that watch it's powerful so we're gonna break yeah. into that too okay thank you you're welcome <laughs> sure you don't gotta ask a question Cheryl. so I love you guys. Um, thank you for joining. We will be back on next Saturday. You guys will have the notes and the recording of this session so you can go back and listen because I know it was like a whole lot of information and we can never write fast enough. But I love you guys and I will see you next Saturday or those of you that are going to the prophetic training, I will see you on Wednesday and send out an email um, this weekend for that uh, meeting. Okay. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you and so, so much. And so my goal is, so let me put this out there. Pay it forward. Train somebody on what you're being trained on. This is in my corporate job. I was called one of the, one of my functions. I was called train the training. So I would corporately train people below me to train other people in their department. So 
I want you to train. I want you to pick somebody to train on what I'm training you. Train your daughter, Cheryl. Train your daughter. Seriously. Train the trainer, guys. Spread, spread the information. Amen. Amen. I love you guys and have an amazing day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.